The Tom Woods Show, episode 454. Prepare to set fire to the index card of allowable opinion. Your daily dose of liberty education starts here. The Tom Woods Show. Hey everybody, Tom Woods here. The episode today is a little bit late, and I've got some good news and bad news here. Let's start with the bad news. The bad news is I had a conversation with somebody I better not name because I'm just mortified and I don't know how I'm going to handle this because I don't know the person. I, I just know the person's work, so I don't have a personal relationship with this person. And I found out that our conversation on such an interesting topic, on the police, what did we do before we had the modern police, which is a much more modern invention than people think. And it was such an interesting historical conversation. And for some reason, my system here recorded a grand total of 10 seconds of it. I have not had this happen in 454 episodes. I am crushed and devastated. I came in today thinking, I can't wait for people to hear this episode. So I don't know what I'm going to do, to be honest with you. I don't know how I'm going to approach this. But for now... I don't have that episode. I do have a backup system that I wanted to be using for a time like this, but I've been waiting and waiting for this store in Topeka to send me the equipment I need. And, you know, I mean, I, I might as well be waiting in Antarctica, you know, for a store in Topeka, for heaven's sake, unfortunately. So I am just without that episode, and it's, it's very upsetting and unfortunate. But also, here's another reason that it's late. I'm just getting in from an unexpected trip over the weekend. Some of you know that this past week, was the Mises University summer program that the Mises Institute puts on, and it's my favorite week of the year, and I was not planning on going because I just have a lot going on at home, and I wanted to be helpful at home with the family. And then this past Friday, immediately after I finished episode 453, my wife and children showed up at my office and said, get in the car, we're taking you out for an early birthday lunch because I'm going to be out of town for my birthday, uh, as it turns out. So they're going to take me on an early birthday lunch. And we're driving to Kansas City, she said, because, of course, you live in Topeka, you're going to do anything interesting, you have to go to Kansas City. So off we go to Kansas City, and I did not realize until we were three-quarters of the way there, and she told me, we're not going to any lunch, we're driving to the airport. She bought me an airline ticket and made a hotel reservation, got me a rental car, so that I could go down there for the tail end of the Mises University summer program because she knows how much it means to me. It was astonishing, wonderful. I can't say enough about it. So I spent the whole weekend, flew back today, Monday. This is July 27th, 2015. And so even after the program was over, I got to spend time with friends, and it was just fantastic, wonderful. So what I'm going to do is share with you today the remarks I delivered at the Mises Institute. You think they're going to let me just show up at the last minute and not speak? So you can hear in the remarks themselves what the circumstances were surrounding my suddenly being thrust into the program. They, they, you know, in other words, they asked me, while you're here, would you mind speaking? So I give a little bit of the detail on that in the talk. It's a pretty lighthearted talk. It's just reflections on my own experiences with the Mises Institute and Austrian economics over the years. I reveal something that I have more or less kept a secret for years, which is how long it took me to write Meltdown, my 2009 book on the financial crisis. So there's some stuff in here that I think you'll like. But more importantly than that, if I don't give you this, I have no show. <laughs> I've been gone for the weekend. The show that I had planned for today does not exist. I was away all weekend not realizing that. And so here I am with a talk for you that I sure hope you like, because uh, I ain't got nothing else, so enjoy. It starts with a few remarks. I, I start right when Jeff Dice, the president of the Mises Institute, starts to talk about me. So we're going to start right there, and stay tuned for a couple of announcements afterward. Here we go. So I know all, virtually all of you are familiar with Tom Woods and his work and his background, so I won't take much time to introduce him, but I will just say this about Tom. He shares something with both Mises and Rothbard, very profound, which is that, you know, Tom used to be a more garden variety conservative. He'll even tell you that he was once a neocon in his younger years. And like Mises and Rothbard, as he learned more about economics, learned more about the world, he decided to do what rang true with him. And there are many times in his life, as in the life of those two aforementioned giants, where he could have taken an easier path and just diluted his message a little bit to make his own personal or professional life smoother. 
but he chose not to do so. He chose to stick with what he sees as the truth, and I think we're all the beneficiaries of that, so please help me welcome Tom Woods. All right, well, thanks, everybody. I have a couple of stories I have to start with, but before I do that, um, everybody has one of these just about, one of these devices, so I'd like you to take these out Make sure they're turned on. Okay, turn them on. And I want you to text the word liberty to 33444, and I'm going to send you a free book while you're sitting there. Nice. This book is called 14 Hard Questions for Libertarians Answered, and it covers, it has Bob Murphy in it, talking about law, talking about defense, has uh, Walter Block talking about the environment, has Jeff Herbener talking about what would we do after we get rid of the Fed. We have chapters on banking, on drugs, on sweatshops, all the sorts of things you get nailed on by your friends, all in there, and you get it for nothing while you're sitting here. That's just a miracle to me. That's awesome. <laughs> all right, anyway, let me say some hellos here, because apparently my wife and children are watching on the live stream, I just found out. While I was sitting here over where Jeff Deist is, they said they could see me, so I'm I tried to look professional and decent for them in my t-shirt. So that brings me to my story, why am I not wearing a proper dress shirt? I know you're not necessarily wanting to know the answer, but it actually is a very interesting answer. I am what uh, Pat Barnett has called the reverse mystery speaker in that everybody knew I was going to be speaking except me. <laughs> uh, on my way to the Institute yesterday, I got a telephone call asking if I would do it. And very, very shortly thereafter, I looked at the schedule of Mises U, and I was on the schedule already. And I thought, could she really have had time to change the schedule after I said yes? So I have this funny feeling the schedule came first, and the asking of the question came second. <laughs> That's perfectly fine. But all the same, what happened to me was uh, I, you know, I had a lot of family things going on. I felt like I needed to be with the family this week, even though this is my favorite week of the year, and it absolutely killed me not to be here. And especially, thanks a lot, the, you know, the social media people at Mises giving me photos of the event all week long and video of the chess thing. And I mean, I'm just dying. Oh my gosh, you got to be kidding me. Well, my wife, so appreciative of the various sacrifices that I made more or less without fanfare. I, I didn't whine about it constantly. Surprised me the other day. She more or less pulled me out of my office. I was in the, I was just finishing up episode 453 of the Tom Woods show, which you can subscribe to on iTunes, of course. And she said, we're going somewhere and you're getting in the car and we're going. All the kids were in the car. She said, it's an early birthday because I'm going to be out of town on my birthday, oddly enough. So it's an early birthday lunch. It's a special lunch in Kansas City. Well, we live in Topeka, Kansas, so it seemed entirely plausible that we would have a lunch in Kansas City because that's the only place anything of interest ever happens. I mean, if I, if I want mozzarella sticks with marinara sauce, we can stick around in Topeka, but we've got to go to Kansas City for anything else. So off we went. And as we're going, and I'm thinking we're going for some lunch, we get to about 20 minutes of the airport, and she hands me the itinerary for my trip and says, this is actually your present. We're not going for lunch. She's taking me to the airport because she made arrangements for me to come here for the tail end of this. And uh, it, uh, she got me a rental car and the hotel all set up. It's the most astonishing thing you can imagine that that happened. So she is an, she's just extraordinary. And she knew how much it means to me to be here and how, how weird it was for me not to be here. So what about the dress shirt? Well, I have, a, I have dozens of dress shirts, and they all need to go to the cleaners. I have them all laundered. So I got them in a corner of the closet that she doesn't know about. <laughs> so as far as she knows, I have no dress shirts available. So she packed for me the best she could because, of course, I, ha I need clothes. So she packed me a suitcase. And I could have gone to the store to get a dress shirt for this. But... Going to the store would have meant half an hour not here at the Mises Institute. And to me, I'd rather look like an idiot and, <laughs> and be here at the Mises Institute than, wait, than spend the time. <laughs> All right, so there you go. Uh, I'm just going to say a few, little, a few little things today about, about this program that I myself went through beginning in 1993. That was the first time I was here. Upstairs in the research wing, I'm pretty sure they still have the group photos of all of us from those years and earlier. And you can see me 
in those pictures in 93, 94. And then in 95, I was actually one of the first summer fellows of the Institute. And you can see me there and I have got the mo now I need a haircut and my wife's been trying to get me to get a haircut this week because she knew I was coming <laughs> and I kept saying I'm too busy. Well anyway, you think this is bad. You should see the 80s haircut that's staring you in the face in 1995 in these pictures, right? It's it's not pleasant to to recall. But what is pleasant to recall are uh, you know is the the overall experience that I had here. The Mises Institute saved me from moderate GOP dom and I owe them a lot for that. What kind of a fate is that for any, any person to be a moderate Republican? So I was bad on everything. I mean, you name it, I was terrible on it. It really, is it really, really is true, the old Joe Sobrin adage that, you know, the, the liberal, the left liberal favors intervention domestically and the conservative favors it overseas. And the moderate favors intervention both domestically and overseas. And that makes you a moderate. But if you favor none of this intervention, you're an extremist. <laughs> so there's where the Mises Institute took me, step by step. But thank goodness, oh, when I think back to the stupid things I used to believe. But this is why I can talk to people so easily who still hold the kind of views I held in the late 80s, early 90s. Because I, know, I wasn't an idiot. I just wasn't, frankly, creative enough to think outside the constraints of American politics. You're either Rush Limbaugh or you're, well, this is a little bit of an anachronism, or you're Rachel Maddow. But there's no third thing. But the Mises Institute taught me that there is a third thing. And I've been very happily part of that third thing for quite some time. Now, what I cherish about the Mises Institute is, of course, it's not just what I learned here. But that's very important. But it's also the friendships that I've made. I've made friendships with students, and I've made friendships with the faculty, and uh, even, even with the very chairman of the Mises Institute, and I don't even know if he'll remember this, but it was 20 years ago this year that I spent the summer at the Mises Institute, and during that summer, my grandfather, whom I was very close to, was extremely ill, and it looked as if basically he was on his deathbed. And I wasn't going to be returning until maybe the middle of August. And the doctors were saying he was desperately hanging on because he wanted to see me one last time. And he wasn't sure he was going to make it that long. So Lou Rockwell stuck his hand in his own pocket to pay to fly me back to see my grandfather one last time before he died. Now, there are a lot of think tank presidents who ride around in limousines, and that's where your donation money goes. But here, you have people who believe deeply in this mission. You have institutions out there whom, that I won't name that exist for the sake of existing. They raise money for the sake of raising money. But none of that is true of the Mises Institute. Now, having spent some time here and having gone through this program, I can tell you that I know the feeling that you're having right now, absolute exhaustion. But at the same time, you think I wouldn't change a thing. I, I'm, I'm glad to be exhausted because I spent this week learning fascinating things from wonderful people and making friends from all over the world in Auburn, Alabama. You know, it, it's amazing. <laughs> Sometimes you wonder how your life takes the turns that it takes, but what an extraordinary, wonderful thing this is. Now, I had the great fortune of being at Mises University while Murray Rothbard was still alive. He passed away in January of, two, of uh, bigger part, 1995. So I got to meet him four or five times. And I'm pretty sure on YouTube, somewhere or other, you can hear me telling Rothbard stories. I don't have that many. I, I wish I had more, but they're all super great. And uh, if you ask me later, we can gather around and I'll tell them to you. But th as I say, they are probably on YouTube somewhere. But I remember the introductions of the faculty on that opening night. And the faculty would be introduced in alphabetical order, except Rothbard. He, would, he was in a class of his own. And he would be introduced separately. And everyone stood up for him. You know, in an age where there was no internet, there's no YouTube, People knew about Rothbard because they somehow stumbled upon his books. They dug up his work, and they loved him. 
and he was so wonderful to talk to and he didn't want to stop talking and even though you know I was some kid 21 year old kid completely beneath him in every way he spent inordinate amounts of time talking to me and very interested in, in what I was working on and very generous I even remember a time when I wrote him a letter almost almost daring him because I had heard that Rothbard will write back to you if you write to him so I thought well, I'm gonna test this theory <laughs> what have I got to lose so I wrote him a letter saying that I was interested in this pamphlet that he kept referring to from the 1960s uh, by Robert Lefebvre on the subject of the Cold War and being non-interventionist during the Cold War I found that very interesting but there's nowhere you can find a pamphlet like this so Rothbard writes me a letter back and sends me two copies of this pamphlet and I thought, okay, how does he, first of all, I don't know how he had time to do the things that he did anyway. Again, that he did with no modern research techniques, no internet, nothing, on a regular typewriter. Then he writes all these letters, and then the fact that he sent me this precious pamphlet, that this pamphlet is now immortalized because Murray Polner and I published it in a book published by Basic Books, which is a huge publisher, my anti-war anthology, We Who Dared to Say No to War, now has that pamphlet in there, published, because Rothbard took the time to write to me. You know, that that's... I had no right to expect that. <laughs> but sure enough, you're right to Rothbard, he writes back to you. I don't think it works anymore, but what's interesting is... <laughs> what's interesting is, even though he died in 1995, the books, though, did keep coming. The books from Rothbard's pen kept on coming year after year. Collections of his articles, uh, his, his, uh, his history of, of economic thought that we only got two volumes of before he passed away. The book that had been in manuscript form for a long time and never quite made it on the betrayal of the American right, which I wrote the uh, foreword or the introduction to, came out later, which made me say that there are a lot of professors who only wish they could be as productive as a dead Murray Rothbard. <laughs> Indeed. Now, when we, when we, talk about, uh, we talk about economics, people think we must be obsessed with money. That's what they think. A lot of, the, a lot of average Americans think it's money. We just love money. Well, you know, who doesn't like money? But that is not what motivates us. And this puts me in mind of an insight of, of a friend of mine that progressives understand us far less than we understand them. Like, I mean, we, we may not agree with them, but we have a basic idea of what their program is. They don't seem to have the slightest idea what motivates us or who we are. We say one thing, and it comes out in their ears as another. We say hello, and it comes out to them as, I hate the poor. <laughs> I don't know quite how that happens. So you say economics, and they hear greed. Like, I can't, there's a blockage. I can't seem to get this across. And it turns out that really, when you think about it, we're, that's not what really interests us. What, what we're fascinated by is not money but social cooperation. That's what we find so interesting. How is it possible? And we can understand in a household, you know, with three people in it, how people can cooperate and accomplish their goals. But it's much more difficult to understand how it's possible for millions, tens of millions, hundreds of millions, billions of people to implicitly be cooperating in a worldwide division of labor to produce goods that keep everybody alive without anybody being in charge of the whole thing and barking out commands to people. I mean, that's an extraordinary thing, and we have no right to expect that that just happens automatically. How does that happen? That's what we're fascinated by. And once you get to that point, I think you get to a point where you want to know how else can we imagine society running itself. We know that we can produce goods without these people interfering, but do we need... Do we need violent intervention to prevent so-called monopoly? Do we need it to provide public goods? Whatever. Once we've gotten that taste of how society can be run on its own, we begin to look for ways other problems can be solved on their own without the state's involvement. And before you know it, we've built up this elegant edifice, not just of theory, but also of many, many empirical examples of how intractable problems can in fact be solved without coercion. 
When Rothbard wrote Man, Economy, and State, he used a very detached scientific idiom. You'll notice that he's not in any way speaking the way he would speak if he were reviewing a James Bond movie or giving a speech to a group of people. He wrote it in, a, in the kind of language that a scientist would use. But even in that mode, Rothbard could not resist using words like beautiful to describe the order that we see in the market economy. That we can have this incredible latticework of stages of production again, all over the world, and it all works out without shortages or surpluses, with no guy with a bullhorn running it. He says, this is, this is a beautiful thing, the way it operates on its own. Now, of course, we're supposed to be naive for believing that, but it's not at all naive to think that one guy issuing commands might be a good system. That, that's not naive, but our view is naive. I, I still am fond even though I've talked about it a million times, we've all heard it a million times, but I'm still fond of iPencil. Because I do think there are a lot of really great insights in iPencil. The old story of told from the point of view of the pencil and how difficult it is to build a pencil because when you think about it, it's not just a matter of taking a few things and gluing them together. It's where do you get the glue? And what are the different inputs into glue? And how do you get those? And where does the wood come from? And what do you saw the tree with? And wh where does that material come from? And there are all these different stages that no one could possibly be able to do. No one could possibly know how to do them all. And yet somehow it all comes together. So in my own capacity as a father, by the way, I'm trying to instill into my five children this sense of wonder that I have when I go to the store, for instance, and it's full of things. Now, it's not like things on the shelf is all that life is about, but, you know, when my kid is sick and I can go get medicine at three in the morning, I'd say that's an advance. You know, there's nothing wrong with... And, and, and by the way, for people who say material things don't make you happy, that's not where happiness comes from. Okay, I understand that if I go out and buy a vaporizer, and, you know, and a new hat, that's probably not going to be the most fulfilling thing I've ever done. But on the other hand... Although money can't buy you a true friend and so on and on, you know, it can buy you a refrigerator and preserve your food. It can allow you to travel to Auburn, Alabama and meet all these wonderful people. So, I mean, for people who say, oh, money doesn't make you happy, I say, well, then you people are impossible to please. What are you talking about? Look at all the options that are available to me now. Anyway, so, I mean, I have the services of, of the greatest chefs in the world, if, if I so choose, and apparently that's not going to make me happy. Well, I'm telling you, it makes me super happy. I am super happy. <laughs> but anyway, I have this sense of wonder when I imagine, think of all the things that had to happen for these things to be available for me, and they're available for the equivalent of 10 minutes of my labor. And I teach my kids this. Now, one way I've done that, by the way, is with the help of those Tuttle Twins books that you see out there. Uh, TomWoods.com slash twins for people who are online and can't uh, see them out there. It's a series of children's books trying to get, so that one of them is, del is uh, connected to the iPencil story. And it teaches it to children so that they'll have this sense of wonder. The next book in that series, by the way, is going to be the Tuttle Twins and the Creature from Jekyll Island. <laughs> yeah. So, so much for your innocent childhood. We're going to teach you about the Fed right now, okay? <laughs> so much for your happiness. It's all gone. And I want to add to this an insight from Gustave de Molinari. I, I want to know who the geeks are in the room. Not geeks, I suppose, nerds. Let me be precise. Who the nerds are in the room. How many of you know, by show of hands, the name Gustave de Molinari? Oh my gosh, that is scary. <laughs> That's great. All right. Well, for those of you who don't, welcome to nerddom. I'm going to tell you who Gustave de Molinari was. He's a 19th century writer who wrote, according to Rothbard, is, was really a trailblazer in the idea of a stateless society because he wrote an, a famous essay on the private production of security. And in that essay, he points out that there's, there are economic laws that we observe. And he goes through what some of these economic laws might be. And w one of them for him was that when you have a system of free competition, you have lower prices, you know, more consumer satisfaction than you would have otherwise. And he says, now, the, the laws of economics that we observe seem to be akin to the natural laws of the physical world, to the law of gravitation, for example. They seem to admit of no exceptions. 
And given that they seem to admit of no exceptions, they probably admit of no exceptions. So why do we make an exception for the production of security? And so let me, let me read you uh, this one passage. He says, It offends reason to believe that a well-established natural law can admit of exceptions. A natural law must hold everywhere and always or be invalid. I cannot believe, for example, that the universal law of gravitation which governs the physical world is ever suspended in any instance or at any point of the universe. Now I consider economic laws comparable to natural laws and I have just as much faith in the principle of the division of labor as I have in the universal law of gravitation. I believe that while these principles can be disturbed, they admit of no exceptions. But if this is the case, the production of security should not be removed from the jurisdiction of free competition. And if it is removed, society as a whole suffers a loss. Either this is logical and true, or else the principles on which economic science is based are invalid. Wow, that is pretty hardcore stuff coming from Gustave de Molinari. And by the way, some of you may know I've been working on the Ron Paul homeschool curriculum. In my government course, the students learn about Gustave de Molinari. I, I think that's unusual in a government course. I haven't checked them all, but you know, I think it's a good reason to believe that that doesn't, doesn't typically happen. So he identifies this, and this is why we all think this way. It's not that we're naive. It's that there's a beautiful elegance to the idea that things run on their own. And so un until you can definitively show me that they don't, this is my worldview. And yet most people have the opposite worldview. They don't in any way need to be persuaded, or it takes two minutes to persuade them that coercion is necessary. And they go ahead and repeat the same old shibboleths over and over and over again. And what you're learning at the Mises Institute is exactly the opposite. The research that's done here is of the greatest importance. The Quarterly Journal of Austrian Economics keeps the discipline moving. And so the Mises Institute is not just doing educational conferences for students, which is important, or popular conferences and popular publications for the general public, but is also advancing Austrian economics as a field in ways that are cutting edge and thrilling. The, the Mises Institute was pinpointing the Federal Reserve as a crucial ingredient in understanding the economic problems that we experience long before that had become fashionable. And this is a problem that we see both among so-called free market economists and among progressives, neither of which really wanted to talk about the Federal Reserve until we forced them to. So you have plenty of free market economists who will find every problem in the world, but no mention of the Fed. You can find progressives, and as a matter of fact, I found one just the other day in my, last night in my hotel, in my Facebook feed. I should have just gone to sleep. Stupid me. <laughs> Looking through my feed, and I got this stupid image in my head, and it's keeping me awake because I'm thinking of responses. But it's this image from one of these Occupy groups, and they're saying, they're responding to a very typical kind of free market argument. A typical free market argument would be, if the minimum wage goes up, prices are going to go up too, so, you know, quit bothering with the minimum wage. And they came back with, well... Prices have been going up year after year, even though the minimum wage hasn't been going up. So you can't blame the minimum wage. And then they said, maybe we could blame corporate greed. <laughs> corporate greed. For every single price in the economy going up, they want to blame corporate greed. All right. I'm actually going to pause and refute that for you. I know by the end of this week you know how to refute it, but let's just take, let's just think about this. Let's imagine you have an economy where one good is produced by greedy, a greedy corporation. And through corporate greed, they can just arbitrarily set the price. And by the way, if corporate greed, why haven't they set all prices at $1,000 a unit? If, if corporate greed can just arbitrarily raise all the prices to arbitrary levels. All right. Anyway, suppose you got one industry, it's corporate greed, the prices have gone up. All right, well, I'll be able to afford less of that good, right? Or I'll, if I have to, let's say I still buy one unit of that good, I have less money to spend on other goods. And that's going to put downward pressure on the prices of the other goods. So on balance, there's no, it's a wash. If I'm spending more on this thing, like let's say it's gasoline, like I got to get around, you know, I got to drive my car, so I'll, I'll pay. But now I have less money to buy, you know, rutabagas. So the price of rutabagas will go down. So there's no overall 
rise in prices. So likewise, I mean, if you have three goods that are produced by greedy corporate, okay, that gets more expensive. I have less money to buy other things. So what could possibly make all prices go up simultaneously? Only an increase in the supply of money. And it ain't corporate greed doing that. It's a particular institution that you would think progressives who are supposed to believe in questioning authority would be all over. They would be talking about this thing forever. But you almost never... No, not quite never, but almost never hear them talk about the Federal Reserve. Except to say that you're a crank for thinking there's something wrong with it. But their whole slogan is question authority. Here's the most important economic authority in America. And they're going, oh, do, 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 corporate greed. Do, do, do. <laughs> so th that's another reason that what's going on at the Mises Institute is so important. That we're cutting through this silence, this self-imposed silence on such an important topic. And it's a confusion too. Because it was Richard Posner, who sometimes, I think he's called a libertarian so by, by some people. And he wrote a book on the financial crisis, and he's blaming it on laissez-faire. And somebody said to him, but don't you see that the Federal Reserve had a role to play? And, you know, because the, the, he was saying capitalism caused the crisis. But people said, what about the Federal Reserve? He said, well, the Federal Reserve is part of capitalism. Well, then, now we're just arguing about stupid definitions. But how helpful is that? But finally, we cut through. You can't understand boom and bust if you don't talk about the Federal Reserve, the central bank. Well, in, in any case, I truly cherish my experiences here. Again, not just for the friendships, not just for the, the hospitality. The things I learned opened up just so many doors for me, both opportunities and just intellectually, for the sheer intellectual pleasure of it. But for instance, in 2009, when I wrote a book on the financial crisis called, called Meltdown, I couldn't have done that if I hadn't had the training I got from the Mises Institute, because they were saying, you've got to produce that book in three weeks. Well, by the way, you're the first audience I've ever admitted that to. I was given three weeks to write Meltdown. And they said, uh, because everybody's going to write a book on the financial crisis, so you have to be the first one or not out at all, and we will rush the book out for you. So... We made a compromise, and I wrote it in four weeks. Big, you, know, you can see I drive a hard bargain. <laughs> and that, you know, that book did quite well, and it helped to get the word out about these, these sorts of topics. I mean, mainstream radio was talking about the Federal Reserve. Okay, there's no way I could have done that that fast, and therefore it wouldn't have been done at all if it hadn't been for the Mises Institute. There's no way I, could, I would be doing the things I do today if it hadn't been for the Mises Institute. They, they are what, when I left that, Mises University, I said, this is the truth, and I want to devote myself to it. I, I wouldn't necessarily have done that otherwise. And I, now this is all I do. Like, it's almost ridiculous. I've got 453 podcast episodes. Somebody stop me. Like, this is getting ridiculous. Who can listen to all that? I don't know. People do, apparently. That's super. I'm, I'm, I'm glad. But as you leave here, think of ways you can help the Mises Institute. You know that old expression, you've got to give back to society. And I thought, oh, I didn't take anything from society. Why do I have to give it back? All right, maybe that guy's car. But other than that, I don't have anything to give back. I didn't take anything. But you kind of did take a little something from the Mises Institute, right? I mean, like food and shelter and all these awesome people and the materials and everything. So I'm not trying to guilt you about that. I mean, we told you it was going to be free. All you have to do is, hear, is listen to this one guilt-inducing talk, and that's the only thing you have to pay. But as you think about that, think of ways you can help. And it can be simple ways. Follow the Mises Institute on Facebook and like every single post. Because the more likes you get, the more other people will get to see. It's, it's the Facebook algorithm. The more likes a post gets, the more widespread that post becomes. Little things like that. Retweet everything from the Mises Institute's Twitter account. I mean, let's, they've just doubled their followers on Twitter and Facebook. Let's double it again. That's a simple thing you can do. You can tell people about the Mises Institute. You can tell all about the wonderful times you had. You can share the YouTubes. You can someday, when you're super wealthy, you can donate to the Mises Institute. You can support. And, and you know, and I, by the way, I'm not on salary here or anything. So I'm saying this because I believe in it. Like, there is nowhere on earth I would rather be than in this building right now at this particular event. Think of ways you can help, because after a week here, you know how great it is, how important what's going on here is, and you also remember the thrill that you had 
as you were first encountering these ideas will help other people have that thrill too. Don't keep it to yourselves. Help them to have it too by helping and supporting the Mises Institute and remembering and cherishing the time you had here this week. Thank you very much. All right, everybody, a few things that you might find interesting. Number one, you may be familiar with the podcast idea that Bob Murphy and I have to be called Contra Krugman. That every single week, we would review and critique Paul Krugman's New York Times column. Week after week after week, relentlessly, we would do this. It is a great idea because you will teach economics that way. People say, oh, why are you giving Krugman the respect, and why are you giving him all the attention? Well, because he, what, because he has millions of readers? I don't know. Because he's the public face of Keynesianism in the United States? I mean, why are we picking him? You can teach economics by showing where Krugman goes wrong. And don't tell me this is just preaching to the choir. Absolutely not. And by the way, as you know, I believe in preaching to the choir as does any good pastor. <laughs> of course you preach to the choir. You don't tell the choir to leave during the sermon. You, Of course you preach to the choir. And I do teach my choir stuff so that when they go out and speak to the non-choir, they have a lot of good arguments. But this show will go beyond even that because there are a lot of people who don't like Paul Krugman, but they don't know anything about Mises. There are a lot of standard Republican Party people who really don't like Krugman, but they don't know why. They can't really explain it very well. So we're going to introduce a lot of these people to Austrian economics. I have high hopes for it. I think it's going to be great. Well, anyway, we announced that we were going to launch it in April, and I just had a lot going on, and I decided I just can't. I've got to postpone it for the time being. And we indefinitely postponed it, but we did not abandon it because we knew we wanted to do it. Well, we're announcing that we are doing it starting in September 2015. We will have Contra Krugman up and running. It's really exciting. If you want to stay tuned for the official announcement with a date, a hard and fast date, then subscribe to my newsletter, which you can do at the very top of TomWoods.com. There's a little thing about you know, stay notified about when things go on with Tom Woods, and there's a little notify me button. Click that and sign up, and you get a free ebook as you heard at the beginning of this uh, episode here. So do that. It's going to be fun. Great. We're looking forward to it. Secondly, a lot of you good folks have been asking me about podcasting because I know a little something about it, having done 454 episodes of this show. People want to know what do I use in terms of equipment and software and whatever. So at some point, I will come up with a resource page on podcasting for you. I can tell you right now that the microphone I use, you'll find it at tomwoods.com slash microphone. I have a very, very expensive microphone that the Peter Schiff people bought for me back when I used to fill in on his regular show when he used to have it. But even though I have that very, very expensive microphone, I don't use it because I have this microphone, whatever it is, the ATR, Audio-Technica you know, ATR2100, and it's $60. And I love the way it sounds. I, I like this microphone. I think it sounds better than the expensive ones. So tomwoods.com slash microphone will take you there if you're, if you're looking for a good quality microphone without breaking the bank. I mean, we already broke the bank on a microphone, and I don't even want to use that one. So that's how good this one is. Well, anyway, on podcasting, there is a great resource that will help get you up and running, and it doesn't cost you a cent. So until I have my thing up, I'm going to direct you over here. And that is the Podcast Workshop by John Lee Dumas, who's been a guest on this show. And you can sign up for his free webinar, which is taking place this Thursday, July 30th, at 2 p.m. Eastern Time. Sign up for it through tomwoods.com slash paradise, because he's got a thing called Podcaster's Paradise. tomwoods.com slash paradise will get you over to that live webinar. You've got to sign up for it, and he'll send you reminders you will not believe how much you learn in a free webinar. It's free, and you learn thing after thing after thing about podcasting and strategies and growing your podcast and all kinds of things. Can you earn money podcasting? All of it is there. So I urge you, if you've been talking to me about podcasting, watch this webinar, tomwoods.com paradise. Also, of course, remember... 
If you've been meaning to start that blog, I've got a video that shows you step-by-step -step how to be up and running in just five minutes, plus a whole free ebook on how to do this without having to learn anything about programming or design. You can find that all at freewebsitebook.com. Show notes page for today is tomwoods.com slash 454. I don't know what I'm going to be putting on today's show notes page. I'm sure I will think of something. Thanks for listening. Become a smarter libertarian in just 30 minutes a day. Visit tomwoods.com to subscribe to the show for free, and we'll see you next time.